All right, so again, tonight's presentation is titled You're Digging in the Wrong Place, Historic Preservation and Archaeology in Wisconsin. So just before we get into all of what is going to be addressed tonight, I figured the best thing to do is provide an overview. And so we're going to start off by, you know, talking about a few things first. Why did I title this presentation, You're Digging in the Wrong Place? What does that mean? And then going to go into talking about and, and addressing some of the romanticized ideas and misconceptions of archaeology, which will then jump into, uh, you know, looking at archaeology realistically. What is it? What do we do? How is that work done? But also, why is it important to do archaeology? What, what makes it uh, very integral to, you know, community-based efforts and just anything to, to understand about our, our past and the places we visit? After that, we will then transcend into understanding the history of federal and state laws, um, it can be complex and weaving, so we're not going to get into the true nitty gritty and full details of everything, but we're going to approach just a few of the fine points that are important to what we're looking at tonight. And then finally, we're going to just take a look at a few of the sites in Sauk County that are pretty important. Uh, we're not saying that any not, the other sites are not, but uh, these are some that have some interesting uh, pointers uh, when looking at uh, applying some of these federal and state laws that protect them. And then we're going to wrap it all up in a shiny, beautiful bow and just bring it all back and understand what we've learned tonight. And uh, I hope you take plenty of uh, in information from this presentation. So again, you've probably been asking when this, since this presentation was announced was, uh, Seth, why did you, you know, why is the title you're digging in the wrong place? And it's not to chastise or point fingers or say, how dare you, you know, you shouldn't be digging that, you shouldn't be going there and finding artifacts, you shouldn't be, uh, you know, walking in cornrows or anything like that. That's not the point. Um, so there's a scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, no, the first Indiana Jones movie, where Sulla and Indiana Jones, they come to realize that the Nazis are looking in the wrong place for the Ark of the Covenant. And, you know, as an archaeologist, I've been an archaeologist for over a decade now, uh, it's, I, I love these movies, but there's, while they're very dramatic and very romanticized and, you know, give a really different look to what archaeology truly is, there's still some, some truth in what is said. And so the reason why I, to I chose to title tonight's presentation, you're digging in the wrong place, is not to say that you're, you are or you're not. It's to say, like, there are some ethics we should look at um, when we go and do archaeology work, or as whether we're professional archaeologists or we're avocational artifact collectors. There's, there's rights and there's wrongs. And I just want to make sure that going forward that you have the right knowledge and the information um, when you're going out to enjoy the outdoors, the the sacred landscapes and 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 um, and the culturally sensitive areas, because we don't want to be disrespectful to uh, to known sites or unknown sites. We want to provide that sort of good ethic and integrity to what we all do when we're looking at the human past. So that is why I chose this this uh, title, uh, You're Digging in the Wrong Place. So again, not pointing fingers, just saying it's kind of got an ironic catch to it. So looking at archaeology from the silver screen, from your TV, um, it has been, as I've stressed quite a bit, is heavily romanticized over time. Um, as I said, you know, you have the Indiana Jones movies, uh, new ones coming out here in the next year. Uh, you've also had in the other parts of the 80s, you had Romancing the Stone with Michael Douglas. Um, and uh, then as we moved into the 21st century, you know, major stress on, on TV shows and other movies like Disney's National Treasure or recently Legends of the Lost, ho hosted by Megan Fox. And, of course, the wonderful, very unique show known as Ancient Aliens. As the saying goes, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. Uh, so, these shows have had placed archaeology at their core, at the center. 
but they've really stretched out what archaeology truly is. And in some places, in some shows and movies, have really just erased the true definition of archaeology. And so, uh, while it's great that archaeology has been seen in this different lens, it's, give, it's been given popularity, it's really discriminated against at the same time in terms of, you know, understanding what it truly entails. And so with that, I want to discuss what archaeology is really defined as and what we do. So archaeology defined, uh, it's actually a subfield of anthropology. And anthropology is a uh, is the study of human culture. And there's various subfields to anthropology, um, but archaeology is one of them. And what archaeology defined is, is the study of human culture through past rem material remains and their context. So what that means is that these material remains, as the old saying goes, one person's garbage is another person's treasure. And archaeologists, you can essentially call them historic dumpster divers. Uh, what I mean also in, in reality, though, is uh, we look at the artifacts, we look at these features, you know, whether they're, you know, pre-contact projectile points or arrowheads, ceramics, of uh, unique designs of indigenous people, uh, features, old post holes or their wall trenches. Overall, we have to understand that these are small pieces to a jigsaw puzzle that help tell a story of day-to-day -day lives, how they practiced, you know, um, different um, uh, actions or activities, I guess I should say. Uh, you know, and how did they progress? How did these 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 tools, these technologies, uh, just how did things evolve and gradually change through time? And how did people maybe recede back with with technology or with ideas and beliefs? And so, looking at these things at archaeology sites, it helps to look at and understand and interpret more like the the pro most appropriate term is how people live and how we've gotten to where we are today. With that, I should jump back to understanding the misconceptions of archaeology. Again, it is not that we are getting chased by large boulders or booby traps. We are not having fist fights or shootouts with evildoers. We're not jumping uh, across one cliff to the other to save the damsel in stress. It is we are scientists. We study, we interpret, we do research, whether it's digging outside and doing controlled excavations to laboratory analysis and technical report writing. It's much more dry than the romanticized adventures that we've come to know. But there is one more problem, and that problem is this. Archaeologists don't dig dinosaurs. Big sensor sign, prohibited, it just nix it, get it out of your brain. One of the com common things I'm asked is, Seth, what's the coolest dinosaur you've ever found? And I go, none. <laughs> and so uh, what? who digs dinosaurs? Paleontologists. They study fossils. Archaeologists, again, study past human cultures and human materials that are left behind. So just to get that clarification out there for all of you. So why is archaeology important? As I've stressed, archaeology sites, well, they're destructible. Once we excavate them, they cannot be replenished. They cannot be replaced. That, that data where it was those artifacts, those features, they were located in the ground. Um, once we dig those out, we can't place them back in the precise, accurate spot. So it is completely crucial to record while recovering these cultural materials, these artifacts, it helps again to understand those jigsaw puzzles, those pieces to the jigsaw puzzle, to interpret the past, the people's past, interpret how societies, cultures, how they acted and reacted with each other and how they interacted. Um, and it also helps us look at comparing at different sites, you know, like looking at say, uh, what if there was like a village site on current day Reedsburg um, over a thousand years ago. How did that relate to maybe the Holbert Creek garden beds near present day Wisconsin Dells that uh, we're going to get into later tonight? Um, so it's it's incredibly important to look and in how do we compare and contrast. But 
most importantly, it also helps us to give back to those uh, descending communities uh, and cultures and how they've become today. And I think when we add those oral traditions and their, their sacred understandings, um, it goes a long way to, to maintain that um, very uh, intimate piece of, of cultural societies uh, from the past to today and for the future. So with that background, with now that we've, you know, taken out the, uh, in a nutshell, the, um, the debunking the romanticisms and the dramatizations of archaeology, interpreting and understanding the reality of archaeology for what it is, it's now time that we're going to go into uh, the history of the federal and state laws. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it is really important to understand that there are a lot of ways that these can be studied and interpreted as an individual that went to undergrad and graduate school for uh, studying, you know, federal and state laws, primarily federal state laws, especially, um, that there's, they're very complex. They can be a very uh, controversial way of, of studying them. I've studied them for months in, in various semesters. And so I don't want to burden you all with such dry stuff pun intended everyone um so there's only a few that we're going to really look at tonight and over time and that are the ones that follow here under federal we're going to take a look at the antiquities act of 1906 historic sites act uh from 1935 and then we're going to also look at other ones including the national trust for historic preservation the national historic preservation act and nagpra the native american graves and repatriation act and then, coincidentally, we're going to take a look at two key state statutes that are crucial towards, you know, archaeological cultural resource management work. Um, and that is Wisconsin Statute 4447, which is a protection of archaeological sites on state and public lands. And also another one called Wisconsin Statute 15770, the Wisconsin Burial Sites Preservation Law. So the first one comes down to uh, 1906, the uh, Antiquities Act. And Teddy Roosevelt, essentially, uh, he was very, he saw the public lands as being important to the, the preservation of American history. And so he felt it was really important to uh, put into regulation a, a law that prohibits any excavation of antiquities, a very antiquated term for artifacts or any cultural materials, um, that, you know, anything of excavation of, of these artifacts or antiquities from public lands, they cannot be done without a permit from the Secretary of the Interior. Um, and furthermore, it gave the president the full authority to declare any specific piece of land as a national monument which would therefore protect it from any sort of uh, disturbance or destruction. And so this sort of plays a key role also into the establishment of uh, not just national monuments, but also the National Park Service. And so this was sort of laying the, the groundwork, the framework for what, um, as an umbrella, for more of these uh, historic preservation laws that we will talk about tonight. So uh, we all know Teddy Roosevelt was very... Um, very prominent or proactive on, you know, for national parks and monuments. So uh, he was also a very fine steward for establishing um, our, our preservation laws today. The next one follows up in the Great Depression, and that is the Historic Sites Act. Um, this was established by uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, and it was also formed basically by Congress. And essentially what it does, it, it it really further enacts that that Antiquities Act a little bit more by establishing a national policy for preservation and uh, creating of programs based on preservation efforts. So this almost coincides with with the New Deal um, for, by by Franklin D. Roosevelt during the Great Depression. So it created a lot of uh, uh, new jobs and, and and projects, and that includes not just uh, you know like the Civilian Conservation Corps, but it also did the Workers Progress Administration, um, which really established 
the laydown for for um, prominent archaeology and, and cultural resource management throughout the United States. So without this act, without the New Deal, uh, there would not be a, a very robust archaeology program throughout the uh, United States like it is today. Um, so in, in addition to that, but also, like I think I mentioned, the Historic American Building Survey, it, it also had a uh, establishment for not just, you know, um, doing archaeology excavations, but also understanding what sort of uh, buildings that are associated with, with the United States that, you know, have of historic value. And so there was various building surveys done throughout the United States and all across the different states. Afterward, President Truman in 1949 established the National Trust for Historic Preservation Act. And essentially what this did was it really, you know, strengthened or bolstered, excuse me, the uh, the ability to have the public to participate in preservation of sites, buildings, and objects that of are, excuse me, that are of national significance or of in, even international interest. So essentially what this did, it really enforced that public participation that, you know, as we see... Uh, any sort of historic structures or archaeological sites, whether they're historic or prehistoric, or you know how I like to use the better term today, pre-contact, that you know the public communities have a right uh, to say what is crucially important to preserve. And so, without this this law, you know, it, the unfortunate thing that this law didn't do at first was provide that federal funding. But it was over time, as we'll see, that the federal funding. Uh, would go towards the preservation of various sites and historic buildings of that, that object of national significance or interest. Now, one of the other ones that I didn't put on the, um, the, the, the framework of the discussion for tonight was uh, President Eisenhower's National Interstate and Defense Highways Act. And I don't want to, you know, provide too much, you know, excitement over this because it really wasn't all that exciting uh, because the, this this highways act was enacted in 1956 excuse me 1956 as a way to you know in, in establish that there would be faster routes for troops to depart if the nation was under attack and so we know these roads obviously today as our modern interstates and highways uh, that you know get us to point it from point A to point B, uh, much quicker than taking the old county back roads. Um, so what this did, it, it had essentially a huge monumental impact to various uh, sites, archaeological sites, prehistoric, excuse me, pre-contact sites, and historic sites throughout the the, the country. And so there was a major rush to uh, try to do excavations where these new interstates and roads were going to go. Um, but it, it caused a lot of disturbance where a lot of sites were essentially destroyed without any sort of uh, recording or excavation and research. As we, as, excuse me, as we go forward, um, when President Johnson took over um, in, the, in the 60s, um, Lady Bird Johnson, his wife, was this wonderful lady that was particularly dedicated to improvements and beautific beautification of poorly maintained areas, uh, as well as historic and natural preservation. And so there was a book that came out uh, during this time that, you know, with, that was titled With Heritage So Rich, that declared that the historical and cultural foundations of the nation should be preserved as a living part of our community life and development in order to give a sense of orientation to the American people. And so Lady Bird Johnson really was a, a, a prominent catalyst in, in the next uh, Historic Preservation Act, um, which we'll look at here. And so with the National Historic Preservation Act that was enacted in 1966 by her husband, uh, President Johnson, this established pretty much the, the, the foundation for what is used for uh, uh, surveys and 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 research and and, and documentation um, for for various historic and prehistoric uh, sites. 
So this includes the establishment of the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation, known as the ACHP, and also the uh, for states, the State Historic Preservation Office. This also establishes two other things, uh, the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and what this means that NA, NRHP, it means that a location or a property must meet one of four criteria for eligibility. And those four, those four criteria can be, one, associated with events that have made a significant contribution to our nation's history. Two, associated with the life or lives of a significant person or persons of interest of our past. Three, the property embodies distinct characteristics of a type, period, or a method of construction, or represents a significant and distinguishable entity. And the fourth criteria, uh, property must show or may be likely to yield information that is important to history or prehistory. So, you know, if you go around and you tour um, some areas uh, or structures, you may see a plaque that says this is on the register uh, or been registered in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so that's what that entails. It, it provides that uh, ability that it can provide, can gain uh, federal funds to maintain it in its original state. Uh, and then it cannot be truly disturbed or you know modernized uh, to the best ability possible. Uh, and then the other one is Section 106 that was established under the NHPA. And what this basically means is, uh, and this is geared more towards you know historic uh, properties that need review or, or uh, understanding or, or research, or as well as archaeological sites. Uh, that anything that gains federal funded projects or projects with federal funding uh, or permitted projects with federal funding that have impact on historic properties or archaeological sites are to undergo a review process and also assess their level of impact. So in case there's, say, like uh, case in point, um, if you're a local and you knew last summer that uh, on Highway 12, heading south of Baraboo towards Sauk City, that there was a recurving being done by the former Badger Ammunition Plant, or known today as the Sauk Prairie Recreation Area. And so there was that new uh, reroute or curving um, was needing uh, for a review process and assess of level of impact because it was going through a, a few archaeology sites. And so I was on that project, and so I had to assess, you know, and make sure that nothing archaeologically or uh, culturally significant was going to be impacted during that time of construction. And so I just want to provide this other photo here. Here's President Johnson, you know, uh, signing into law the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, with um, other people of Congress and other politicians. But more uh, excitingly, you see uh, Lady Bird Johnson, First Lady Johnson, excuse me, uh, in the background, the only one that's truly looking at the camera. And I think the smile or the smirk says it all. Uh, she is, I, I think, elated. Uh, she, is, she was absolutely prominent and, and very uh, a force to be reckoned with when it comes to uh, anything in regards to... Uh, preservation of natural or historic resources. So now with um, all the federal stuff out of the way, we should really talk about what's happening in Wisconsin during this time. Um, and it was actually, ironically, uh, a year before the National Historic Preservation Act was put into law, uh, we were one step ahead of the curve. Uh, or a curve, excuse me, and that was we established our own Office of the State Archaeologist in 1965. So what is the Office of the State Archaeologist? Well, essentially what we do, uh, and I'm not a state archaeologist, but I, I do have a relationship with the Office of the State Archaeologist as I work for the Wisconsin Historical Society, is that the Office of the State Archaeologist, or OSA, uh, keeps track of the archaeological records uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin. So any archaeology sites that are found, whether they're pre-contact or historic, or farmsteads, uh, village sites, uh, cemeteries, burial sites, you name it, there is a, a, a record list uh, or a database for, um, for all these recorded sites throughout the state. And so they maintain and keep track of those. 
but also they keep track of developments that comply with any federal and state laws. So anything like with the aforementioned state laws, we've talked, or excuse me, federal laws that we talked about tonight, they go through the review process. They make sure that any projects that are taking place, um, that they're complying with those federal laws, but also the state laws that we're going to look at too here um, later. In 1972, uh, the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society also established the Division of Historic Preservation. And essentially what this does is that they oversee archaeological th research throughout the state. And they also review work of agencies that are doing research with governmental agencies, construction firms, or the general public. So there's different, you know, uh, different hats that are working in this division that look at the different projects that are being done, whether they're road construction activities, uh, you know, modern historic buildings are getting uh, modernized or some sort of development is happening, or, you know, there's just general public education that's being done or working with, um, you know, municipalities uh, or local agencies on um, what what is going on that may have any disturbance or uh, act, um, intrusion on any archaeological or culturally significant sites. Now, um, with that National Historic Preservation Act, it still had some issues. And basically what that the act did, NHPA Act of 1966 did, it provides that preservation, but it's only for public lands or cultural resources. And obviously, if we know about Wisconsin and also very, throughout the land, of North, uh, excuse me, United States or North America, actually, we should just say it like that, is that this land was first inhabited by indigenous people, okay? And so their cultural resources, they are, a lot of them, if not all of them, have a very sacred significance. And so why is it just these public lands? Why is it just these, you know, common cultural resources? And so we need better stipulations for uh, preservation of not just these archaeological sites and historic sites, but for tribal lands as well, and to recognize the tribes that are that inhabit that still and have forever have uh, inhabited the land long before us. And so in 1985, uh, Wisconsin actually joined 31 other states to enforce these better stipulations for for preservation. And out of that came for Wisconsin. Uh, the uh, Wisconsin Act 316. And essentially what this does, it, it enacts as follows, and I'll read it off this. This bill proposes statutory protection for human burial sites in this state. It was prepared at the direction of the Legislative Council of American Indian Study Committee Subcommittee on Indian Burial Sites. And so as we know, and we'll look at one of those sites in particular tonight, is that um, Wisconsin is well renowned for the effigy mound culture or the mounds that were built in the shape of various animals um, and so you know there used to be thousands hundreds countless of, of mounds of different shapes whether they're conical round dome shaped or linear these you know long tapered rectangular shapes um, in, in addition to the effigy mounds um, there used to be countless men then they were just getting heavily destroyed due to agriculture urban development, construction, and so forth. And so it was really integral to uh, understand that these also deserve just as much um, recognition for preservation as do uh, other historic sites as well. So that's what established in 1985. And we'll see how this, this actually promotes, um, or yeah, it gives a promotion or a sense of uh, inspiration for another federal law that we're gonna look here shortly. Following uh, the the law, Wisconsin Act 316, uh, in 1987, um, the Wisconsin Act 316 or 316 uh, was turned to a state statute known as um, Wisconsin Burial Sites Preservation Law, and this essentially really, you know, cemented that mounds can be defined as grave markers. They're sacred. They We have known from archaeological excavations over countless years um, that there are human remains in these mounds and that they should be, you know, it would be um, 
very wrong if somebody came to uh, a modern cemetery today and say dug up uh, a, a relative of mine and so it's it's just as important to preserve these as cemeteries as we preserve our modern cemeteries today so that meant that these mounds were entitled to protection and this includes that any and all burial sites uh, that are whether on public land or private land are entitled to preservation and and to be uh, have any construction activity or distur ground disturbance activity just to be uh, not happening for them. So one of the things I should mention if you are listening tonight is that if you are a private property owner and you may have a burial site or maybe know of whether it's a historic uh, unmarked grave site or you may have a mound or you think maybe a mound you should have that catalog. There are catalog burial sites and there are uncatalog burial sites. Um, and they're all, you know, seen underneath the Wisconsin State Historical Society Division of Historic Preservation or the Burial Sites Preservation Office. And so if you know that, you are entitled, that there, there's a really great uh, incentive and that you can be entitled to reduction in property taxes that are calculated by the local assessor's office. And so if you feel you have a mound or a burial site on your property, um, please do not be scared by that. I, would, I strongly advise you to contact your burial site preservation office and they will work with you to help you uh, make take care and maintain that site because it's very sensitive and sacred. So with the establishment of Wisconsin Act 316 and Wisconsin Burial Sites Preservation Law, Wisconsin Statute 15770, um, that with all the 35 other states that were really, you know, focused on try or excuse me, 31 states that were uh, pushing for better stipulations for for burial site preservation, this really had a was served as a catalyst in a sense for the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, also known as NAGPRA. And this was enacted in 1990. And what this essentially does, this differs from the burial site preservation law. This is meant and intended for federal land and tribal land, those federally recognized tribes. Uh, so it addresses also the accidental discovery of any Native American or indigenous remains. And so if there's remains that are exposed that you know have an association with indigenous people or an indigenous site, uh, then there needs to be a, a stop to any ground disturbance activities, uh, contacting of uh, known federally recognized tribes or the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and the State Historic Society. And then, you know, it sort of becomes of how do we repatriate these, are, these uh, remains so they can be respectfully undisturbed for the future. And this also coincides with remains that were, you know, being curated in museums. So whether it was a local historical society or state or even a, a federally funded um, museum or museum that any museum that receives any federal funding, uh, that these these museums with the remains, they need to be repatriated and given back to uh, the recognized tribes. And so it becomes it. This this law has does have some of its faults. It's it's hard to know um, who to exactly contact. But the, the point across is, is that this law provides a bridge to um, connect uh, and, and heal wounds with with uh, uh, tribal nations. And I think it goes a long way. And it, it really serves as a as a great uh, bridge to help mend those wounds and to work together with tribes and, and indigenous people today. So now that we've gotten, I'm sure I've thrown a lot at you so far in this half hour so far. Uh, and as we're getting close to wrapping up, um, I want to now focus our attention on Sauk County. Sauk County, to me, as, as a resident in Baraboo um, and as an archaeologist for the state of Wisconsin, Sauk County, it's the topography, it's it's one of the most luscious and unique and most diverse counties in the state as it serves right on the cusp of the driftless area the uh, tributaries and creeks and rivers this place is rich with with culturally significant sites and i could go 
days, months of talking about all the different sites and locations and history and what makes this place so unique. But I think as, as other, I'm sure, fellow residents that are here tonight listening to this presentation or visitors that have come to Sauk County, you know how special this place is and how it has drawn people for thousands of years. And with that being said, I think it's good that we transition into looking at just three uh, um known sites in Sauk County that have some attention that need to be given to when it comes to these federal and state laws. And that's why we're just going to use these sort of as, I don't know, case studies, but um, but just to give a good rundown as to what they signify and how they are protected. So the first one we're going to look at is Man Mound National Historic Landmark, formerly known as Man Mound Park, but given that it has gotten, it was received its National Historic Landmark designation back in 2016, which I'll highlight again, it is important that we just establish it as such, Man Mound National Historic Landmark. Initially, this was mapped and surveyed in 1859 by Sauk County Surveyor William Canfield, and then it was purchased in the... Uh, at the turn of the 20th century by the Sauk County Historical Society and was given a proper uh, ceremony for a dedication ceremony and has multiple times over and I believe will continue to do so because of its significance. Uh, measuring at a total of 214 feet, it is actually now the only remaining anthropomorphic shaped mound throughout um, throughout the state, if not, you know, North America. Uh, there used to be various others uh, that were recorded and surveyed by uh, as far as Laval and in the Reedsburg area, but this is the only le one left. The other ones were destroyed by agriculture and, and um, uh, development of housing. It was uh, part of the, as we call the effigy mound culture, it was built roughly about a thousand years ago during that time when, you know, the mounds of different animal shapes were, you know, being constructed across the landscape. Um, in 1978, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, that nomination form was, at that time, was only a couple pages and just said, hey, it's it's a mound, it's in the shape of... Uh, a human being, but with the unique horns at the top. Uh, so that's why it deserves that, that recognition of being on the National Register. However, in 2010, that uh, NRHP nomination was drastically revised to give more detail and it was still, uh, is still today on the National Register of Historic Places. As I mentioned at the beginning, it was then placed on the National Historic Landmark status in 2016. And uh, uh, the assistant to the state archaeologist, Amy Roseborough, uh, she was fully, uh, wholeheartedly dedicated to making this not just a National Register of Historic Places landmark, but a truly National Historic Landmark. Um, and so she wrote up the, the landmark or the NHL uh, nomination, uh, flew out to Washington, D.C., stood in front of a panel and, and, and defended it uh, for why it should be on the National Historic Landmark um, Registry. And it so moved past. And so it and the document that she uh, that she, or the application is a very lengthy and tedious document. And if you want to read it, you're more than welcome to. It is on the Sauk County Historical Society webpage. Look under Sacred Sites and select Man Mound National Historic Landmark, and you can peruse that at your leisure. So what does this rep mean then? Um, so it's interestingly, this is actually private property. As I mentioned, this was purchased um, by the Sauk County Historical Society. It's still owned by the, uh, the Sauk County Historical Society, which means this is private property. Um, but, you know, with our master plan and our intergovernmental maintenance agreement with the, uh, Sauk County, um, it it is open to the public. You are welcome to go out there. It's located just uh, east of Baraboo on Man Mound Road. And you can park there and you can look at it and you can see right now what we're doing is a prairie restoration process. Um, and if you want to read more about that master plan, you can do so also on uh, the Sauk County Historical Society website. Um, but this is also protected under Wisconsin Burial Site Preservation Law, so Wisconsin Statute 15770. So that means there can be no ground disturbance activity uh, if there's anything that happens, uh, whether it's tree removal or a tree falls down or something happens to the mound in some way or any sort of ground disturbance activity, it must go to the uh, 
uh, state archaeologist and to the burial sites office, as well as to the burial sites preservation board for review. And, and then there's um, any sort of disturbance has to go through a permitting process. So there's a, if anything does happen, there is a, there's a lot of um, loopholes you have to jump through in order to have any ground disturbance happen. So it is very well taken care of, and Sauk County has done a great job, and we cannot thank uh, the Sauk County Parks and Recreation Department for all their work towards you know maintaining this, this wonderful and beautiful and such sacred site. All right, the next one is the Holbrook Creek Garden Beds, and this is owned by Sauk County Historical Society. So apologies for uh, the lack of a really good quality image uh, showing you these, these very unique and elaborate uh, ridged fields. Uh, but this is an overview over at, at Holbrook Creek, located just off County H, uh, near Wisconsin Dells, in between Wisconsin Dells and Reedsburg. And just to give you a little background on Holbrook Creek Garden Beds, it was initially investigated by Bill Gardner, a professor at UW-Madison in the 1990s. Uh, at that time, he was actually a uh, graduate student and he was focusing on his dissertation doing research. And he was able to investigate and find uh, radiocarbon dates of phytoliths that were there dating back to about 1000 AD, so over 1000 years ago, that these uh, very unique and special uh, ridged ag fields were were being used and uh, so it shows that you know it helps to understand how people a thousand years ago were performing agricultural practices anyway so in 1991 after his dissertation after his research it was uh, listed on the national register of historic places and then in 2008, it was actually at that time in the 1990s up to 2008, it was privately owned by Bill Pierce, a, a private landowner. And he saw the significance of, of Holwood Creek, the, the cultural significance, and it's important to the, the county history. And so Bill Pierce uh, donated six acres in 2008 to Sauk County Historical Society. It was listed as a it was up for sale but it was listed for a very high high value price and again he just wanted to make sure that these these very uh, rare and well maintained and preserved uh, ag or garden beds would be would be well taken care of so he gave that to the Sauk County Historical Society in addition uh, the Ho-Chunk were able to work together effectively with with Sauk County Historical Society and Bill Pierce and provide various uh, documentations and other materials towards understanding what is the significance of Holbrook Creek Garden Beds. So a very collaborative effort between private citizens, uh, the Sauk County Historical Society and a tribal nation, a Ho-Chunk nation. In 2009, there was a cleanup that was established there, and this is a, a very old photo showing of the, some of that um, cleanup that was being done. And uh, it's still, it still has a lot of vegetation in there today, so there's some future work to be had. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that this, this location is uh, minimally maintained, but also it's well protected too. And so uh, what does this mean? Essentially, uh, this is private land. It's also um, on the National Register of Places, so you cannot disturb that, and, and it is only intended for viewing only. All right, and here is just another photo, another overview photo of the Holbrook Creek Garden Beds. You can see Highway H in the background, and. In, within between these trees, you, uh, whether they're early spring or late fall, you'll be able to see some of those prominent uh, cultivated ridge tops within the, the, the property. So uh, at, during the peak time, the summertime, it is with all the, the overrun vegetation, it's very hard to discern and see what is the, the ag fields or the ridge tops. Uh, but so I strongly advise you going to investigate it in the early spring or late fall. 
All right, and lastly, we come to Natural Bridge State Park. While historically known as this very enticing location for visitors since the 1870s, archaeological excavations in the 1950s helped result in a better understanding of Sauk County's earliest inhabitants. As you can notice, there's a little cave below the natural bridge of, it's uh, out of sandstone. And the excavation in the 50s, led by archaeologists uh, from UW-Madison, helped uh, understand that this rock shelter was occupied multiple times throughout many, many different years. Uh, the excavations resulted in going to depths of well over seven feet below the current ground surface and finding an assortment of different uh, multiple or occupation levels. This also includes finding uh, animal remains that are such as uh, deer, elk, passenger pigeon, fisher, mountain lions, bobcats, and various others. Soot on the ceiling still reflects the former fires from when occupants resided within the shelter over time. In 1972, Natural Bridge was designated as a state park and the shelter and natural bridge actually became designated as its own state natural area the following year. So really fascinating that this, this natural area within a state park. It's not uncommon, but it's always unique in its own accord. In 1978, the site was listed on the National Register of Historic Places for its uniqueness. Um, and so it's it's very prominent location, very uh, one of the most underappreciated state parks in my opinion, but it definitely serves as, as a very educational um, tool for understanding not just natural wonders here at the cusp of the Driftless area, but also for uh, cultural purposes and archaeological purposes. And I'm going to show you a couple photos here, and here is one from way back in the day. This is back from the 1950s of Natural Bridge State Park. And as you can see, if you look closely towards the, uh, the rock shelter, which is also aptly named Raditz Rock Shelter, named after uh, the former private landowner, the Raditz family, um, you can see an archaeologist actually back there, and you can see some of the equipment if you look closely. And if you want to look even closer, we can get to show you right now what the... Um, the actual depth of the excavations went. And so here you can see this photo from the actual excavations. This is within the, the uh, rock shelter at Natural Bridge State Park. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can see some very faint foliage. Um, but you can see that you have three ex archaeologists excavating and this is, honestly, this is going beyond seven feet, in my opinion. Uh, and you can sort of see the different levels of soil stratigraphy. And the, the dark stains represent um, um, actual ash and, 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 and fires that were once, and fire pits that were once there. So there was a lot of deposition over time. So just imagine how big this rock shelter actually was at one point in time over a thousand years ago. So there's something for, for you to enjoy. So as we're wrapping up tonight's presentation, uh, looking back now, you know, we saw how archaeology has been promoted and on TV and in the movies and how it was dramatized and romanticized. We understood the, the realities of what archaeology really is about. Uh, we looked at some of the many various federal laws that are in place for protection of historic and cultural sites. And we also looked at state laws, uh, the ones that are currently in, in, in action. And, but we also looked at how they, how the, on the federal level, it in, influenced the state of Wisconsin and how also Wisconsin influenced um, some of the federal laws like NAGPRA. So it's, it's absolutely great to see how our state has worked effectively to better promote the, uh, the preservation and, and education of historic and culturally significant sites, particularly like our, our mound groups here in the state. And then we looked at a few of the, the known sites here in, in Sauk County. So it's great to see how those laws sort of have an impact on, on visiting some of these unique landscapes, these culturally landscapes. So to just wrap it all up in a nice, beautiful bow here on this wonderful present, uh, putting the present in presentation. <laughs> um, basically, what I want to just emphasize is tonight, it was not about pointing the finger and saying 
don't go digging here. It's about how to do it the right way. So that's what the tonight's presentation was about. When I'm saying you're digging in the wrong place, I'm not pointing the finger. It was just a joke with Indiana Jones. But how do we effectively together uh, and support each other in education of studying, analyzing, promoting and educating and and uh, excavating, finding these amazing antiquities and these sacred landscapes. So it works hand in hand with professional archaeologists, but also community members, avocational archaeologists, artifact collectors, just passionate individuals about the past. Without the, without these communities, without these individuals, um, such as yourself that's watching tonight, there's no way to discover and record sites and, and historic sites and archaeologically you know, significant sites that are away from highly disturbed areas. So in order to you know, better promote that you know, uh, protection, you know, this is what that presentation was supposed to, is intended to be. And in addition, you know, another great way to help promote and protect these places is to support your local historical chapters or societies. So case in point here, we have the wonderful Sauk County Historical Society. It's uh, imperative, I would think, to be a member. Um, if, if not, support your local archaeological society. We've got a wonderful one here in the state as well, the Wisconsin Archaeological Society. And if you're not from around here, find your, your local uh, historical society or chapter and get to know them. Get to know the folks. Just be active and proactive in promoting your community's heritage. It's also, as I mentioned, you know, important to learn from each other and not just support your communities, but also uh, support the culturally important landscapes of other groups. So in this case, with you know, how diverse and unique Sauk County is, you know, we have the Ho-Chunk Nation. And I think it's extremely important to acknowledge the, uh, the land that they have long inhabited here from uh, uh, over at Devil's Lake State Park uh, the uh, Sauk Prairie Preservation or Recreational Area, uh, formerly the Badger Ammunition Plant. So we have, uh, I believe it was Daywakachok for Spirit Lake and Maywakachok, if I had that wrong, I am so sorry uh, for Sauk Prairie. So please, if you can, please correct me if I'm wrong there. But it's, it's just important to recognize, you know, all the the past groups and the current groups that still frequent this land and um, help support them as well and each other. So uh, I'm leaving you tonight with this, this uh, photo here that's of a sign out at Kingsley Bend Mound Group in Columbia County, uh, just outside of Wisconsin Dells on Highway 16. And this sign is placed right outside, right near some of the mounds out there. There's conical and effigy mounds. And this was placed by the Ho-Chunk Nation. And it's just a notice recognizing the state burial preservation law. But it also really emphasizes on enjoying, but not destroying American heritage or these cultural sites. Uh, so it's great to promote that. I think these sort of signs really go a long way of being respectful and courteous, but to allow yourself to enjoy as you learn about the past. So. Uh, Thank you all so much for tonight's presentation. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I will now take some questions or comments.